Welcome back to Theodisc, the podcast of WTC Theology, a theological college which combines the best of academic scholarship with the presence and power of the Spirit. Theodisc is the WTC podcast where we have accessible theological conversations to help you deepen your own faith and understanding. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Matthew Bates, who is Professor of Theology at Quincy University. Matthew is a Protestant who enjoys the challenge of teaching in a Catholic context, and he holds an MCS in Biblical Studies from Regent College and a PhD in Theology and New Testament from the University of Notre Dame. He's co-founder of the OnScript podcast and has written several books including Salvation by Allegiance Alone, The Gospel Precisely, Gospel Allegiance, and The Birth of the Trinity. This conversation revolves around Matthew's latest book, Why the Gospel? Matthew has contended that the good news of the gospel is the proclamation that Jesus is King. But why is this message necessary and what difference can it make in our lives and in the world? If you enjoy listening to Theodisc, then please consider subscribing on whichever platform you listen to podcasts and leave us a review. And if Theodisc sparks an interest in you to study theology, then visit the WTC website, wtctheology.org.uk, to find out more. Now, on to our conversation with Dr. Matthew Bates. Enjoy. Well, I'm delighted to have Dr. Matthew Bates on the podcast today. Welcome, Matthew. Thank you so much, Kenny. It's wonderful to be with you. Yeah, we're going to have a, a conversation today about your your new book, Why the Gospel, and some of the work you've been doing around how we articulate the gospel over the last few years. And um, But before we get into that, I'd love to ask you the questions that I subject all of our first-time uh, guests to, which is just some questions to get to know you a little bit, to find out um, not just about the, the work that you're doing at the cutting edge at the moment, but things that you return to, things that are constants in your life. Um, so the three categories of that would be um, a book that you return to, uh, a food or a meal that you return to, and a place that you return to. So let's go with book first. Well, um, there'd be a couple. I'll, I'll, I'll give you three just to be fair. <laughs> uh, but certainly, um, I, I'll, I'm always... Uh, like haunted a bit by Justin Martyr's use of the Old Testament. And I find myself wanting to circle back to his dialogue with Trifo frequently, partly because I'm so I'm so interested in how our authors of scripture read scripture. And um, Justin is in continuity with them, but there's also some differences. And um, I he's he's so dense in his Old Testament citation that it fascinates me. Um, so Justin Martyr as an ancient uh, is term in terms of contemporaries, um, I've circled around to N.T. Wright's um, Christian Origins Project, especially his New Testament, The People of God, Jesus and the Victory of God, um, a number of times. And then I'll give you one in the early church, um, uh, Francis Young's Biblical Exegesis um, and the Formation of Christian Culture. That would be one that I've, I keep finding myself going back to. Excellent. Good. Choose three and cover all the bases. That's, yes. that's it. Yeah, I cheated. <laughs> I just did. I just like added three. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what about a food or a meal that you just you keep going back oh, to? Oh, there's this Mexican restaurant in our hometown um, that uh, they have this dish, fajitas Jalisco, uh, and it's uh, fajitas with steak, shrimp, and chicken. And they give you such an enormous portion that you you eat chips and salsa, and then you eat that, and then you take more than half of it home. And uh, I just cannot stop ordering and eating that. It is so good, and it's it's definitely the place our family chooses most often uh, to go to dinner. So fajitas Jalisco. I was speaking to Jason Myers recently and he used the the taco, you know, oh, and I, yeah. I lived in Texas for a long time. So I know about the, the dangers of the pre-meal <laughs> chips and salsa. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, it just depends. They're free usually. So you just eat as much of those as you can. Right. Exactly. Not here in Britain. Nothing's for free here in Britain. <laughs> um, and then a place that you would return to. Well, my my place I grew up uh, is uh, Bernie, California. It's beautiful, forested, mountains, waterfalls kind of area and uh, sunny most of the time. And it has a true four seasons, but um, just fantastic area in the Pacific Northwest. So um, I've returned there many, many times in my life. My parents recently moved from there, but my older sister still lives there. So I haven't been in two years now um, back to, to Bernie and uh, I'm itching to get back to Bernie, California. Nice. 
We're going to move into just talking about your your book, um, Why the Gospel. And I guess it'd be good to begin with the idea that you've been working with the last few years, that although the gospel is the foundational message of the Christian faith, you've been expressing a concern that um, our understanding of the gospel has become malformed in some way, or even sometimes the way that we articulate it is incomplete. Could you maybe just sketch out a little bit of the basis for your concern about that? Yeah, I'll sketch it briefly here. And then, yeah, for listeners, I do expand on this and talk about six different malformed gospels specifically. You know, but um, the basic concern would be that there's a fronting of Jesus as Savior and that Jesus has died for our sins. And that what we, what we need to do is we need to trust that, that we need to trust that Jesus's death is effective in some way, and that that's really the essence of the gospel. Um, and so that I consider to be a, a concerning reduction of the gospel. And I think many people would share a similar concern, um, but specifically in two ways. One, with regard to the fact that the full gospel involves something much larger, and even we might dare to say Trinitarian at, at the end of the day, right? It's about the Father sending the Son who takes on human flesh, right? And that the incarnation is very much part of the gospel, right? But then Jesus dies for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, obviously the cross part of the gospel too, right? And then he's raised, sometimes that gets left off, right? Um, his resurrection, very important. Um, but, you know, I think most uh, contemporary cultures do a good job and contemporary churches do a good job with getting Jesus's cross and resurrection at the center of the gospel. But I think the thing that they, that is even more dangerous that's left off is Jesus's enthronement at the right hand, um, because this is the moment where he becomes king in the fullest sense. And, um, and so my concern, along with Scott McKnight, N.T. Wright, some other thinkers, uh, has been really to try to front a King Jesus gospel, right? To, to not lose sight of his enthronement. And then as part of that, then, like um, the, a further reduction has happened with regard to gospel response, where we've been taught that the proper way to respond to Jesus is simply to trust, Right? We trust that the promises of God are true in Jesus. Um, I want to nuance that and say that, that we can qualify that and say that we have a, a larger category, allegiance, right? And that trust fits within that, but allegiance is actually the fuller and the correct response because we're responding to a king. So what would you say then to people who would say that that sounds like in some ways you might be minimizing that idea of redemption or forgiveness or kind of pushing that to the side in favor of this idea of Jesus as king, that that's really the gospel. Yeah, what I would say to such people is that that we can only get that redemption through his kingship, right? That the kingship is the vehicle through which redemption comes. And so it's only as the king wins the victory that the benefits of the gospel are made available to the people through the Holy Spirit. So we can't, we can't sort of pretend as if Jesus is savior and then secondarily, okay, he's king too, and we need to acknowledge that. No, like the, the salvation comes through his kingship and through his winning the victory. So we have to keep kingship front and center. And so I would say it's not a desire to in any way uh, minimize redemption, right? But it's, it's actually providing the framework within which redemption happens so that people can understand that it's a king first kind of redemption. Are we talking then about a precision of order? That's a, a word that you use a lot. Um, you talk about precision, you had your book, The Gospel Precisely. Is order then important? Is that really what we're getting at, is, is putting Jesus King as the primary um, thing first? Yes, that's a, that's a helpful way of putting it. Yeah, that the order matters deeply, that like whenever we have gotten the order wrong, and we've talked about Jesus as Savior, and okay, like just respond to him as savior. Okay, and now you've been set free and now you can live in light of his kingship. That's often how we've talked about the gospel is we kind of want to get people saved. And then once we've gotten them saved because they've responded to the atonement in some way, then we want to then go, okay, like Jesus is also the king. He's also the Lord, right? We need to then learn to be disciples. But that's kind of been put forward as secondary, right? Or as a second stage process. And I want to I want to critique that and say that's not quite what the Bible teaches. Uh, the Bible actually teaches that salvation comes through his kingship and that there is no salvation. There's no atonement apart from responding to his kingship. And so we can't we can't package the order in the way in which traditional presentations um, want to package it and remain faithful to the Bible. Mm -hmm.
one thing that you've said, which is I find to be quite helpful, is this idea of Christ not being Jesus' last name. And actually, you've got some, there's some ways that you suggest that we think about that that term Christ and use that term Christ that will foreground the idea of Jesus' kingship in our minds. Yeah, and so, yeah, I give a number of different ways of, of, of yeah, of, of maybe a helpful ways of kind of doing that alternatively, right? If we don't just say Jesus Christ, what should we do as an alternative? And what I what, what I want to kind of assert as the underlying principle there is that Jesus Christ is a claim, not a name. That's the that's the kind of the slogan or the tag I want people to have in mind, right? Jesus Christ is a claim, not a name. Um, and so as part of that, like we just tend to, I think, get sloppy and talk about in Christ alone, this or that. But we've really kind of like, what's what's the referent in our mind? It's Jesus. Like when we just hear in Christ alone, we're like, we're like making that equivalent to Jesus, but really it's a royal title, right? And we need to not lose sight of the royal title, both in our songs, our hymns, but also when we're reading scripture, when Paul says in Christ, this or that, right? He means in the king. Uh, and so when we reduce that down to Jesus, something is, there's some slippage that's dangerous to the church. And I think we haven't attended to that with enough care. So a couple alternatives then would be to talk about, you know, Jesus, the Messiah or or King Jesus, or to talk about Jesus, the Christ, which is one I use frequently, because I want people to like kind of pause and to have to like say, why did he just say Jesus, the Christ rather than Jesus Christ, right? I want people to have to reflect on the fact that the, that Christ is a Royal title. Um, so I'm trying to do a variety of things to to help people. But then as part of that too, just as larger teaching, we just need to teach, right? Like the fuller story about how Jesus became the king, how he became the Christ. And if you go and look at some of the, uh, well, many of the scriptural presentations of the gospel that you find in the New Testament, you see this idea of once you start reading it as the Christ, it suddenly jumps off the page that it is everywhere in the gospel presentation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When we talk about like the most famous presentations of the gospel, for instance, you know, first Corinthians 15, three through five, right. It's not about Jesus dying for our, our, for, for our sins in the course of the scripture, it's about the Christ, right. Dying for our sins. Yeah. So yeah, we, we, we often ignore that as because we just become attuned to thinking about the Christ is Jesus, which is true, but it misses the Royal dimension. Even Romans, which, you know, have been, has been condensed down the Romans road as this way of expressing the gospel message. You look at Romans 1 and you find that there it is at the very beginning. This is the message about God's son, the Christ. Yeah, yeah. There's lots of language about Jesus as Lord and son of God in power right at the beginning of Romans. We have that description of Jesus um, or the, God, the son, as that he is described further as the son of God in power after uh, you know, his uh, move toward enthronement. So he's raised in order to assume that station of being the son of God in power. And one of the things of kind of expanding out from then this idea of the gospel, not just being about forgiveness and redemption, but about Jesus the Christ, is it seems to me that it then um, encapsulates the whole of Jesus' story rather than just a singular point of the cross. Yeah. And so when we think about why are the gospels called the gospels, right? If they're about the kingdom of God and which, which is about how God is becoming King through the process of Jesus becoming King. Right. Um, and N.T. Wright has a delightful little book on this, how God became King. Um, but anyway, yeah, the, we see this all over, right? Like from the beginning, like why is Herod threatened, right? By this was that there's a new King that's been born. Right. And so we, we have tended to mute like some of those passages that have to do with kingship and we haven't really attended carefully to the fact that Jesus is in the process of becoming the Christ. That's the way I would put it, is that on the one hand, although you know, the God the Son is sent for the purpose of taking on human flesh so he can become the king, there's still a historical process that has to be worked out. Right when Jesus is first born, he's only the Christ in some sort of anticipatory sense. Right, he hasn't fully become the Christ yet, because that means an office that involves reigning, and it also involves anointing by the Holy Spirit. So, like his baptism, for instance, fits into his life story not as some sort of, you know, and identification with. Um, it's not it's not just sort of like him identifying with how you enter the church or or something like that, which is to kind of read our later Christian theology into it. What's going on there is he's getting anointed with the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's the main significance, right? As he as he identifies with the repentance of the people, right? And the spirit comes upon him. Well, that's when he becomes the Messiah within history, right? He is now the Christ. The Christos means the anointed one. 
uh, because the Holy Spirit has descended upon him. And so then obviously we see then at the end of his life too, as he's dying on the cross, like, you know, the King of the Jews, you know, which is over his head, you know, and, and, and various things like that, that would help us attend to the royal motif, you know? So yes, when we read the gospels with, with care, we do see that kingship is all over the place. We're about to have a coronation next week in this country. Um, and it's funny, this idea that Charles is ascending to the throne. Um, I think t instances like that help us to go back and reevaluate what we mean when we say things like Jesus has ascended um, and give kind of a greater context of his kingship. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting. It's been in the news that he has, you know, um, or either that or pe people who are part of his entourage have asked that people swear allegiance to him you right. know tr traditionally this has just been done by people who are part of the peer class right but but this is something that uh, is going to be for everybody that they're invited to swear allegiance and so that's interesting right um what do kings do kings demand allegiance um that's that's appropriate even in a system where the kingship has been weakened right um and the monarchy doesn't have the same clout that it originally had um nevertheless uh kings still crave loyalty or allegiance should we be surprised if that's what um is th if that's what it means to respond to the gospel and if a fundamental purpose of the gospel is that we give allegiance i don't think we should be surprised yeah well that's interesting because i think we have often expressed it as faith as being this kind of sense of a, a mental assent or a, a trusting in jesus mentally or a faith that our faith is valid um but you've kind of reframed that along with many others really as this sense of giving allegiance to a, to a king yeah so yeah the difference would be that faith is something that is externalized and relational is how i is how i like to describe it and here i'd be drawing on the the research work of people like peter oaks and Teresa morgan uh, as sort of the substructure for that. But yeah, the allegiance part has been something I very much find. David De Silva would be someone else who's worked a lot on Pistis' loyalty. Um, so th yeah, there are a number of other scholars who would speak in this way. And I think it's well known to New Testament scholars that the word Pistis can mean uh, uh, allegiance, um, but our traditional translations like kind of pigeonhole it into faith and belief in ways that have made it difficult for people to see the larger resonance and also the history, kind of the DNA of the Protestant Reformation. Right. What did Luther and Calvin emphasize? They really emphasize this trusting in the promises, right? Which is valid as part of what we mean by faith, but is not all that faith means. So this more expanded vision for it, I think, can can help the church make sense of a whole bunch of things. The faith works dichotomy begins to make sense. Uh, what it means to enter into salvation, what it means like like once saved, always saved. But all these things begin to get clarity, I think whenever we understand that faith means something more than just trust, it also means allegiance. In your new book, Why the Gospel, you are exploring what the gospel is and what it means to give allegiance to this King Jesus, the Christ. Um, but you're also exploring why the gospel has been given to us in the first place. I was struck by your example that you asked a room full of pastors why we have the gospel, and that was a difficult question to answer. Mm -hmm. um, so could you maybe talk a little bit about, about that kind of impetus for the, for the book? Yeah. And so, yeah, as I was looking at you know my own previous writings and also looking at the literature around the gospel, I realized that there was a kind of lack in terms of thinking about the why question. Um, and I think that's an important in two ways. One, like we should be able to articulate the logic of why God, God gave the gospel. That's part of the book's purpose. The other is like, why should anyone c continue to respond to the gospel today? Like the existential question for us personally, like how is the gospel still a compelling story? Like what might grab somebody and why might they still respond to it? So I really, I didn't feel like I had dealt adequately with either of those questions in my previous writings. Um, and so I wanted to circle around to that. So speaking to the logic of the gospel, I mean, there are many things we could say about why the gospel. It's a multifaceted answer that scripture gives. Um, but I think that um, like maybe I can frame up some of the key issues by speaking about how the pastors responded to this question. Um, and the, the most common response to the question, why the gospel, on the one hand, is maybe stunned silence. I haven't thought of it that way. But on the other hand, like the most common questions that people have given historically to that would be so that we can get to heaven, 
or why the gospel, it might be that so we can get forgiveness of sins or why the gospel so that um, because God loves us, like which all three are, of those are valid answers, but they actually, I think, short circuit the um, they short circuit a little bit the deepest motivations. I mean, the loved one gets to God's deepest motivation. But beyond that, like, I think that especially the forgiveness of sins part, like we tend to move to that immediately, like, well, why the gospel? But well, because we need forgiveness. But that's, I think that's actually to position the, that's to position the question from a kind of a self-centered direction. And is it any surprise that we would be self-centered, right? Um, But we tend to think about, well, what do I need? What do I get out of it? And the gospel's for me. We don't think about it being for God or for God's purposes very much, right? Um, And if we think about God's problem, like what problem is God trying to solve through the gospel? That can help us remove ourselves from the center and to kind of take a broader aim. And from God's perspective, I think what's going on is that God creates humans in order to rule on his behalf, in order to distribute his glory to creation. So that like all of creation, including our experience of one another, would be an experience of God through the vehicle of human rule. Um, but then, of course, like we, um, we become obsessed with self-rule, right? We decide, no, actually, I want to be king over my own life. I want to make my own moral choices. I want to decide what's good and evil for myself, right? Um, and so then we take upon ourselves the kingship. We, we decline God's kingship. We take upon ourselves, um, we put ourselves upon the throne, right? And then all kinds of chaos is unleashed into the world that's harmful to it. Um, and so what God is trying to do is he's trying to undo that damage, right? That something as damaging has happened to creation. And so the problem is not just that like we sin and we need to be forgiven. The problem is that our sin causes harm, right? And so what needs to happen then, and our, and our sin also causes, uh, like makes glory not get distributed. Like God's glory is to reach all of creation. And so our sin problem then is actually a, a glory problem. And so when we think about like, what's the deepest logic of the gospel, God wants restoration and he wants restoration of humanity. He wants restoration of creation and he wants restoration of his own honor. All of these things are bound up with the the failure of glory to be distributed. So I think actually when we pay close attention to scripture, um, it's a story about glory's loss and glory's recovery through the gospel. Yeah, even in terms of like Romans three saying all fallen short of the glory of God, we we have self centered that and we've retranslated that as um oh we've not we're not we're sinning, we're not measuring up to some kind of standard. It's interesting that what you've just said there puts it in a completely different context. Yes, yeah, very good. Yeah, with in Romans one we talk about the glory exchange, right? We worship idols and therefore like we lose glory. Right. And so as part of all that, right, we become like the non-glorious idols that we worship. Yeah. And so that all have fallen short of the glory, meaning that like we are not, it's not that we're not measuring up to God's standards. It's not the precise point in that passage. It's that we actually like are not bearing the glory, right? Would be the key idea. And then in in Romans 8, right, we get the creation longing for the revelation of the sons of God, right? Because they need the creation is longing for the glory uh, that attends what redemption will mean for humanity. So yeah, it begin, it helps us make sense of um, some of the fundamental substructure of, of the theology of Romans too. And so there's a wider thing at play here than just me getting my sins forgiven. There's an issue for all of creation that's dependent upon um, humanity really being restored to that place of being God's image bearers, glory providers to the whole of creation. Um, and only Jesus the Christ can do that. How does that affect the way that we approach discipleship um, or the way that we, you know, we carry our, our lives as Christians in the world. Yeah, I think it helps us to see, obviously, that our discipleship is integral to our salvation, right? Is that what, like, discipleship is about, is about us being restored in the midst of our brokenness, right? So that we then carry glory appropriately to creation, to one another as God intended, which then also brings God on right? So that our discipleship matters for our salvation, and it's part of the transformative process that God is working out. So instead of it making it all like, like sometimes the weight of emphasis within some streams of Protestantism has been on like the initial moment of forgiveness, like yeah. what's called justification, right? And, and that's kind of made the load-bearing piece in the whole infrastructure, right? Um, but I think that's actually not a good reading of Paul um, and of the theology of the New Testament as a whole. 
And so whenever it helps us to see that, like, no, God is about bringing about transformation and that justification is important. That's how we enter into the forgiven people. Right. Um, and that's that's sort of the, the, the beginning of the process as we're working out that um, discipleship and that glory bearing in the midst of the Christian community. But that that part, too, is about our salvation. Right. Um, yeah. And uh, I don't think that we can just say that's all sanctification either. We're, we're starting to use slippery categories that I think Paul himself doesn't fully embrace. Now, I don't get into all that quite in this book. Um, I, I'm still writing on these topics, but do more on that in Salvation by Allegiance alone. Um, this book is um, aimed more for um, just the general Christian reader. I don't use a lot of theological lingo. I'm trying to, um, without, yeah, to make it as as um, accessible as I can for as many people as possible without compromising the content or dumbing it down. There is a tension, though, isn't there? I hear a lot this idea of, you know, it, it doesn't matter what we do as long as we're putting our trust and our faith um, in Jesus. And yet the tension is there. And actually we, we do know instinctively that it does matter <laughs> what we do. Yes. And so I would hear sermons, you know, that are, that are kind of trying to straddle that tension um, and not quite um, making it. And this kingship idea really, um, really helps to fill in that piece. Yeah, uh, that's that's how I feel about it. I think the allegiance metaphor, yeah, with respect to the king helps us to see that, yes, it's it's about, um, it's not that we're earning salvation. It's not that we're, you know, um, it helps deal with those kinds of questions, right? But that we have this trajectory of loyalty, this intention that's publicly declared, right? That we're going to give allegiance to this king. And that's the basis of our salvation um, as we are united then to this king um, and to all the benefits that come through that channel, right, of union with this king. So, yeah, I do think it helps us to um, make sense of some of the faith works questions that we have, as then we can see that works are part of allegiance, right? That's something that is, a, um, it's, it's it, because faith itself, the word itself is something that's relational and externalized. It does help us make sense of the faith works question. Yeah, and that's something I do, again, like more of in my other books, especially Gospel Allegiance, Salvation by Allegiance alone. Um, and this one, I center more on the questions of why the gospel um, so I don't get into the faith works conversation mm -hmm. a whole lot in this book. But um, what you do say in this book is um, you talk a lot about how this makes a difference to the way that we express the gospel to those who aren't Christians. What difference this message of Jesus as King makes to those who don't yet um, know Christ. Maybe we can talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so one of the ways I, I, I have a, my last chapter, well, last two chapters in the book really are focused, especially on like the question of like people who are, you know, like either not ever participating in the church, the nuns or the people who have participated and they've left the nuns, right? <laughs> Trying to like, speak, how can how can this be good news still for them? And then the final chapter is called like, well, I think it's called gospeling backward with purpose. Um, and so, yeah, the point of that is to help people to think about alternative techniques uh, for why, uh, for how to present the gospel in a way that's more winning in contemporary culture. Um, and uh, I have a number of suggestions there, but one of the things I focus on is um, on the order, getting that right, right? Um, but beyond that, like helping people to see that maybe the connection point that uh, people need is the, the connection point around something good that's damaged, right? That um, maybe we've had a tendency to start um, or to be taught that the way to evangelize is to help people to see, okay, God is righteous and you're a horrible sinner. And so like, you know, you need to acknowledge like all the brokenness in your life and repent in order to enter into salvation. The, the, there's truth to that, obviously, and I'm not trying to discount the truth to that, but I do wonder like if, you know, hellfire warnings are the best place to start. And maybe the best thing to do is to help people get a glimmer of something beautiful, something like, full that they can see like this is true and good and beautiful and and that but as part of that they can see the taint or the tarnish um, and so that they identify that I've had a fleeting moment or where I encountered beauty and creation or I've had a, a, a brief experience of relational wholeness that was just so life-giving and then why did it go away like what like what happened like where was the, where was the, why why was that tainted um, and and kind of like pondering those moments where they encountered truth and goodness and beauty um, and then seeing the taint that overlaid that or tarnished it in some way 
um, reflecting around that can maybe be a point of restoration for people as they, what's going to motivate people to respond to the gospel is when they see something good um, that has been tainted or tarnished, but they then are motivated to say, through God's help, this thing can be restored. Most of the time, that's the self, right? And it needs to begin with the self. Like, I realize, like, I am a tarnished person, right? Yeah. I, 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 I realize I am fundamentally good, or I could be, right, if I could just get out from the weight of my sins. And so um, once we respond to King Jesus, right, we begin to then, um, through the process of gazing on him, come to be transformed into his image. So there's this hope of restoration. But it goes beyond just the human project to all of creation. You talk about how our own experience of that brokenness and transformation can be an effective point of communicating the gospel, where we're not just saying, once you give allegiance to Jesus, everything is just kind of sorted out. Um, That in fact, that we're all on this journey of a continual growth in in our giving our allegiance and and living that out. Um, So can we talk a little bit about that, about how we can avoid kind of a triumphalism yeah. Um, while still um, inviting people to see the goodness of what it means to have Jesus as king. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, triumphalism can be a danger. That's equally off-putting as people then just, they start sniffing hypocrisy, right, behind mm-hmm. that, um, and rightly so. So we have to be careful. Um, on the one hand, yeah, we don't want to suggest Jesus isn't bringing real healing. But on the other hand, we don't want to be like, yeah, like I'm holy there, right? Um, I'm like, uh, I'm perfect now. Um, so yeah, I think that the, the allegiance language does help us with all of that. Right. As, um, I think an effective starting point is to say, like, let me, you know, if you're wanting to share the gospel with somebody, a good place to start is to start with your own brokenness and say, let me tell you my story about brokenness. And then let me tell you the story about how God has brought healing in this area. Now here's some other areas where I'm still broken. Right. Um, and I'm like, I'm more, I'm like praying that Jesus will continue to heal me, but because I've seen healing in this area, you know, I'm, I, I see that he can bring healing and I'm confident he's going to bring about this fullness of restoration for me, if not in this age, in the age to come, right? There's going to be this fullness that he's, he's bringing me toward. So I think the metaphor of a journey, right? The metaphor of, um, you know, of, of, of a partial restoration in certain areas, right? Um, that, that can help us avoid a triumphalism, but also allow us to be authentic and people want authenticity. And so do I right? We all do. Like, we don't want to be, yeah, one thing that turns people away more than anything else is hypocrisy. So that this helps us to to safeguard against, you know, um, yeah, um, a a false triumphalism. Yeah, and it ties us into our kingdom now and not yet language, which actually is maybe not the best language to communicate to other people. It's kind of that kind of internal language that you use. But if we're talking about um yeah, each of our journeys and that allegiance to Jesus, um, I think that's helpful. Um and I think as well, one thing you spoke about was and this kind of ties back into um this idea of our own discipleship, that we can have doubts um and be working through some of those issues of faith that we have, but we can still be giving allegiance to Jesus. And and as we're working through that, and that whole way of expressing it, I think would be a real relief to people who are sometimes tortured by this idea of, am I expressing enough faith because of the thoughts that I'm having or issues that I'm working through? Yeah, it does help, I think, um, yeah, help with the issues of doubt, right, is even on bad days when I have mental questions or, you know, a, a lack of trust personally, like I can still have an allegiant attention. I can still say, okay, even if I've fallen down and I've sinned, like I can get back up, I can repent from that. And I can say, I'm going to be, I'm going to try to be loyal to Jesus again. Um, and that can be hard. And yeah, the modern world throws many, many faith questions in front of us, right. That are mental questions. Um, and um, I think that in the face of those, like the antidote maybe is sometimes bodily action. Like when we try doing what Jesus says we should do, maybe we do discover he is the king. Maybe we do discover he is the right way after all. Um, and so that embodied faith or embodied loyalty, I think, can help us with our doubts in a whole variety of ways. But it does remind us that the fundamental thing Jesus wants is our continued loyalty, despite whatever doubts we might have. Just as we come to a close here, I think what comes through to me is that we can we can have these conversations about, as you, we spoke about earlier, about precision and getting the message 
correct. But this is not just merely uh, uh, an exercise in theological ordering, that this has a real effect on our lives and it has a real effect on communicating the gospel to others. And I think that comes through in your book that there's a there's a passion for the gospel of Jesus the King to be um, expressed in a way that draws people into that same relationship with him. And as we just finish up here, if there's you know one thing that you you could um, express to the people that are listening about this, um, what what would what would that be? That Jesus is King first, and that He is our Savior through His kingship. And that we need to give a loyalty to him in his capacity as king, because that's how the benefits of salvation flow to us. And this is not just for our sake, but also for creation's sake and brings honor and glory to God. Excellent. Matthew, really appreciate you taking time and being with us. Hopefully that's given people a lot to think about and to check out your book, Why the Gospel, and some of the other things that you've written as well. Appreciate you giving your time. Thank you, Kenny, and I appreciate all that you're doing in the Westminster Theological Center, too. Cheers. Well, thank you, Matthew, for such brilliant insights into the Gospel and for clarifying certain assumptions we may have about what it means to follow Jesus as King. In our next Theodisc episode, Kenny had a chat with the other Matthew from OnScript Podcast, which you should also be listening to, by the way, this one being Matt Lynch, who recently published a book called Flood and Fury. He addresses a number of tricky passages in the Old Testament and encourages us not to simply skip them, but to discover the deep riches within the whole Bible. We can't wait to hear this discussion. Thank you for listening to episode 17 of Theodisc. Join us for episode 18 with Matt Lynch on the parts of the Old Testament we often overlook. Bye for now.